Live after in New York with the Fitzgeralds, Edward and Peggy, and James Brady of the New York Post, and of uh, Eyewitness News, and of uh, novels, and uh, a new piece coming out in Geo Magazine, but in German. And in many fine saloons, too. <laughs> I, I finished a book, you know, I told you, uh, which Delacorte is mm -hmm. publishing uh, in hardcover uh, about uh, ten months from now, and uh, then paperback a year after that, and I've just started a new book. Was for, this a uh, novel? Simon and Schuster. Yes, another novel. Mm -hmm. This one uh, set against the background of, uh, of the newspaper business. Oh, mm -hmm. It's called, the tentative title is Press Lords. Press Lords. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh, well, you've done one uh, on the perfume business now. It's Paris One, uh, which I did about four years ago, and that was a very uh, successful novel. It, it uh, hit the bestseller list and was sold in a lot of foreign countries. It's fun to see a Japanese um, edition of your own work because you can't read a, a bloody li line of it, you know. <laughs> uh, the only reason you know it's your book is because they send you a check. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has now been sold to a company called Quinn Martin, uh, which is going to make it a television miniseries, probably in uh, uh, 1982. This will be Quinn Martin. Quinn Martin. Of Chicago. I don't know. I, I I dealt with people here in New York. I don't know where they're from, but they package a lot of television uh, material. Uh, they do a lot of miniseries and things like that. Well, he's mm -hmm. a big name in the Middle West, and mm -hmm. I believe he has a a job on either the News or the Tribune. There, Quinn Martin. No, it's a company called Quinn Hyphen Martin. It's oh, two I names, see, two I different. See. No, no, it's not the writer Quinn Martin, and. Uh, you know, we were talking uh, uh, before off the air about the newspaper war in New York, and, and perhaps we might want to talk some more about that. Yes, well, let's do it, but uh, let's uh, first listen uh, to another message from uh, Potamkin. If you're looking for a new car, listen to these unbelievable Potamkin Cadillac Celephon prices. 1981 Coupe de Ville, 11995 1981 Sedan de Ville, 12295 1981 Fleetwood Brome, 14095. 1981 El Dorado, 14595. And all of these beautiful new Potemkin Cadillacs come luxuriously equipped with automatic climate control, AM FM radio, automatic transmission, power steering, brakes, windows, seats and doors, and much, much more. But hurry, this Potemkin 1981 Cadillac Celophon is a limited time offer. Don't miss out. Come in today on the east side, York Avenue and 60th Street, on the west side, 11th Avenue and 55th Street, or call 399-4400. Just think, you can be driving a magnificent new 1981 Cadillac for as little as 11995 from Potemkin. I'm Mario Perillo of Perillo Tours, and I want to tell you why thousands of people book my tours of Italy a year in advance. I've been sending tours to Italy and only Italy for more than 36 years. Perillo Tours takes you to all the must-see sites and many that most travelers never get to, all for less than $100 a day. My tours fly only on Pan Am 747s in wide-bodied comfort and stay at only first-class deluxe hotels. What's more, my 16-day escorted tours save you more than $700 a person. I'm booking my April through October vacation trips now, and I'd like to send you a free Perillo brochure while choice dates are still open. So see your agent or call me after 9 this morning at 212-584-8300. 212-584-8300. Out of state, toll free, 800-431-1515. 800-431-1515. Um, Jim Brady. Uh, Edwards left the table for a moment, so uh, he'll miss out on what we're saying, but we'll fill him in when he comes back. Um, <coughs> we started talking among ourselves here uh, about um, the curious newspaper position with the extra edition of the, the afternoon edition called Tonight of the, um, of the Daily News. Um, has the Post put out any more editions than usual since... Uh, Yes, change. we uh, we reacted last uh, August and or September, whenever mm -hmm. the uh, news started an afternoon edition. Uh, so we, um, uh, you know, Rupert Murdoch is the owner of the Post, and uh, mm -hmm. he's a guy who doesn't waste any time when he decides he's going to do something. He just goes ahead and does it. So he went out right away with a morning edition of the uh, 
of the New York Post, and uh, it sold very, very well. You know, afternoon papers in this country do not generally do well, and uh, uh, the New York Post is now the, not only the biggest afternoon paper in the country, but it's the fastest growing newspaper uh, in point of view of circulation of any paper in the country. When he bought it from Dorothy Schiff uh, about four years ago, uh, it was selling less than a half million copies a day. Now it's selling about 750,000 copies a day. In other words, he's, he's added a quarter of a million uh, newspapers per day. And the morning uh, business has helped us immensely. I mean, it's cost us some more money. We now put out eight editions, which is very costly. You do put out eight, eight editions? Eight editions. And, uh, of course, the news has spent an awful lot of money trying to establish this thing called the Tonight version of the news, but it confused everybody. Mm -hmm. It, it contains some very, very fine writing. Uh, you know, they hired Clay Felker, uh, who's a very good magazine editor. He created New York Magazine. They hired him to run uh, the news mm -hmm. tonight. And uh, so he has some wonderful writing in there. But the thing is very complicated, and people don't understand. They don't know whether they're getting a warmed-over version of the morning paper or whether they're supposed to buy two newses every day or what they're supposed to do. And then they started this advertising campaign, which confused everyone further because it, the whole thrust of the campaign was it must be fun to work at the Daily News. Well, the idea of, a, of an ad campaign is to tell people it must be fun to read the Daily News. Never mind work at the Daily News. All they were getting from that was a, a lot of applications for jobs. I saw some of the Post's ads on that. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they were very funny. So we twitted them. Now they've changed that campaign mm -hmm. to something else. Uh, but the, the New York Daily News, uh, as you know, is owned by the Chicago Tribune. And no one knows how long the Chicago Tribune is going to be willing to underwrite these tremendous costs of uh, running an all-day newspaper, which is not selling uh, that many more copies. Well, why was it um, falling circulation that uh, persuaded the news to attempt yes. this new venture? Yes, the news of uh, uh, oh, 10, 10 years ago, I would say, uh, was selling more than 2.5 million copies a day. And now it's selling perhaps a million four hundred thousand. So they've lost more than a million copies a day in circulation. Now, some of the problems, uh, some of the reasons for this are not their fault. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people have moved to the suburbs who were mm -hmm. originally news readers, and they're now reading Newsday out in Long Island, or they're reading the Bergen Record over in New Jersey, and so on. Uh, and there are fewer newsstands in New York, and they close earlier at night because of crime and so on and so forth. But meanwhile, the news has been on a real slide for mm -hmm. 10 years. And uh, the Times has been on a course of steady growth, not very spectacular. I guess the Times sells about 900,000 copies a day. And the Post, of course, the third paper in town, the weakest of all three, has the uh, has the only real uh, substantial growth over the last four and years. And you're up from a half million. We're to up from a half million to three quarters of a million. Well, now we, we're still uh -huh. we're still a little bit uh -huh. slow on the advertising, uh, and we would all like to see more ads in there. Uh -huh. uh, but we think that the uh, circulation growth has been so healthy that the advertising will then inevitably come. Um, we buy four copies of the news every day. We buy two copies of the Post. You say you had eight, um, eight editions. editions. I didn't know that. I know we buy uh, the earliest we get our hands on and the latest we get our hands mm -hmm. on here in this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, the amount of newspaper, you know, it just seems criminal to be throwing out that content, uh, just the sheer bulk of newspapers that, that we get here every day. We get two copies of the Wall Street Journal and, um, oh, you know how, how many publications, of course, you right. get the same you thing, You get the too. Times. Well, yes, we get two editions of the Times. We get the early edition before we go to bed at night, and then mm -hmm. we get the late edition in the morning. And uh, so we're avid newspaper buyers, uh, but I, um, I really am confused about the, uh, the way the, the news has put this extra Tonight edition together. It is 
I even made the suggestion once that I didn't think was too bad that, that those separate sections, they print on different color paper, so at least you can find one section it's from another. very, very difficult to find. Uh, for example, I turn to the Manhattan section. Mm -hmm. I want to see what, what they have in there, and it's very hard to find. It is. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it reminds me of Newsday. Now, I know Newsday is a very successful, important newspaper out in Long Island, but I can never find anything in Newsday. Mm -hmm. it, it can totally, uh, of course, I'm easily confused. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can find I can find things very easily in the New York Times. I know where everything is. I can find things very easily in uh, the New York Post. Uh, well, you're an old codger. That's why you, that's, that's you're true. resisting change. That's true. Of course, the news did one thing that I dearly love. They put Hagar on the front page of the comic section on Sundays. Hagar yeah. is the only comic strip I read, and well, I am so told, delighted. <laughs> somebody told me that. Um, uh, Mr. Patterson, or the owner of the news, the founder, I believe, decreed that Dick Tracy had to be on the front page of the comics. And for many years he was, but Hagar has made his yeah. way to... Mm -hmm. My favorite cartoon is, uh, not because it's in the Post, but uh, is uh, Andy Cap. Very funny, very funny. Edward cartoon. Grease more. <coughs> uh, uh, Andy Cap is that is that um, Englishman who's a rascal. Mm. He's always got a cigarette in his mouth. He's yeah. usually drunk. And he cheats his on wife his, does all the work. His like wife works. He hasn't worked in many years. He cheats on his wife. Uh, he's a dirty player when he plays football or rugby, uh -huh. and um, he's a thoroughly uh, admirable oh. kid. Oh yes, mm -hmm. sir. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I miss Al Cap. Oh, yes. I, uh, little not, little not, Abner's not creator. Not personally. He was not an easy fellow, to, not a difficult man to dislike, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I I think his little Abner was one of the classics of all time. Uh, Edward, after many years, persuaded me to read Little Abner. And so the only other comic strip I read regularly was Little Abner until Abner. But, Jim, looking at you just now reminds me again... I am very fond of a series on TV, it's now on Saturday nights, called WKRP Cincinnati, the radio series. Do you, have many people told you what an exact duplicate you are of the young advertising manager in that script? No, I have never seen it. I, I never watched well, situation comedies. You, this, this one is so unlike uh, situation comedies and well, is so to true stop. to what happens in radio stations. Jim, you must stop if I'm to manage your career any further. You must stop and read the comedy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I want you to watch WKRP at least once okay. to see and yourself. I look like this, uh, this guy? Well, he looks like you. He looks the like other. me. Yes. I th I'm convinced you're a type who's going to look uh, 28 years old all your life. Well, I hope so, now that I've gotten to 29. <laughs> no, you you uh, you have a, a youthful contour of face. Well, I'm beginning to get a little little gray in my, uh, in my hair, and uh, whether I should start touching it up, I don't know. But, uh, well, does President Reagan dye oh, his I, hair I assume not? he dyes his hair. I don't know what all the nonsense is all uh -huh. about. Uh, if he dyes his hair and, and lies about it, mm -hmm. then, then he's a very foolish man. Because his uh, ballot knows. Uh, sure. Well, now, tell me, would Mayor Koch dye his hair had he hair to dye? No, no. Uh, mm -hmm. Mayor, Koch is, uh, Mayor Koch is not a very attractive uh, man physically, but he does the oh, most. To me, I think. Uh, he, he does the most of with what he has. He certainly is. Uh, whether he has much or not, he appeals to me. But I he has that <laughs> funny sing-song voice, but it becomes very effective, and it almost becomes uh, hypnotic. You yeah. find yourself listening to it. I want to um, ask Jim something about the anti kosh people, apart from Gloria Steinem and, and so on, if, if he knows about it, but I want to take care of a couple of commercials here. First, one has to do with Empire Diamond and Gold Buying Service, because if you have diamonds or gold to sell, you know, you're in an odd position. You're not an expert, probably, on that. And if you go to some place where they say, what do you want for this, what are you going to say? You can't give an informed answer. They're the experts. They, if they're on the up and up, ought to tell you what is worth at today's market. Well, at Empire, Jack and Emily Broad and their associates, that's what they do. They tell you what your gold or your diamonds are worth. And uh, 
most people are pleasantly surprised, even jolted at how much they're worth, because if, if these things were bought many years ago, you've no idea the difference in the prices on those two commodities now. Well, anyhow, uh, we have known Jack and Emily Broad for a long time, and we uh, think they're fine people to deal with, and we, we gladly endorse them. Empire Diamond and Gold Buying Service, Empire State Building, 66th floor, open 9 to 5 weekdays, 9 to 2 on Saturdays, and their phone is 564-4777. And let's hear a tape I made for Sandler and Worth. When Lou Sandler reduces seven luxury carpets to only $12.99 per square yard, you know he means business. I'm Peggy Fitzgerald, and to me, Sandler and Worth's sale means outright bargains. So if you're a luxury shopper, go for fantastic savings, and if you're a value shopper, there's more for your money. If I were you, I'd ask first for their nylon Saxony from Evans Black. Imagine an Evans Black Saxony for only $12.99 per square yard installed with pad. You save $5 on every yard, and this wonderfully dense style can stand the hardest wear. The lovely classic texture and the decorator colors are so rich looking. I'd love to start picking my favorite, but it's your turn to choose now and save up to $6 per yard during Lou's incredible sale. But make sure you're there with the weekend. Do go to Sandler and Worth in Springfield, Route 4 Paramus, Eatontown, North Brunswick, Succasuna, and their new stores in Bricktown, Flemington, and Manhasset, or any other of their fine stores. So is general manager. Oh, indeed. Yes. Here we are, back in our living room with the Fitzgeralds. Jim Brady is here, and I noticed one of, I of Jim's items in uh, his page six in the Post today had to do with the anti-Kosh group. Um, who are they? Well, there's a, um, you know, Ed oh, Pardon me just a moment. Yes. The anti Kosh or Koch? Ka Ka I'm talking about Mayor Koch. I don't Thank know you. how to pronounce that word. Koch. Koch. Mm -hmm. uh, he, however you pronounce it, he will accept your vote. <laughs> well, I will give him mine if I... <laughs> he, uh, he is so popular at this point, uh, not with everybody. There are people who will think Koch is a terrible man, but... Uh, he is so popular generally that uh, apparently the, uh, they were having a great deal of difficulty not only getting a Democrat to run against him in the primary, but to get a Republican to run against him in the election. So he will probably get the Republican endorsement as well as the Democratic. So a group of, of people who don't like Ed Koch, uh, Gloria Steinem is one of them, uh, Jack Newfield at the Village Voice, uh, Ted Keel, the labor lawyer, mm -hmm. and uh, they are trying to get... Uh, uh, a, a candidate, and they're trying to get uh, some issues out in which they can battle uh, Ed Koch. I don't think they're being terribly successful. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, uh, the, the Post has supported Koch, so I suppose we're, we're not entirely unbiased. But uh, Beth uh, Fallon in the Daily News, uh, uh, the other newspaper in town, mm -hmm. <laughs> wrote a very funny column a couple of weeks ago. I wish I had thought uh, to write it. Uh, she said, well, I noticed that they're having a great deal of difficulty getting anyone to run against Mayor Koch. Well, I'll run. I'd love to be mayor, and I like to kiss children, and I like to go to parties, and I like to shake hands and eat hot dogs and Coney Island mm -hmm. and so on. I thought it was a charming column. But uh, short of Beth Fallon, there doesn't seem to be anyone out there who's terribly anxious to take on, uh, on the mayor, and I would expect that he will sweep uh, back into power uh, next November. Of course, I, I expect so, and I hope so. He's very quick with the um, uh, uh, odd retort. This thing about West Side Highway, if it's built, he said it'll be the only four-lane highway that has a stop sign on every block. <laughs> <laughs> he's a, he's a, uh, a remarkable uh, fellow. I uh, was not terribly impressed by him when he was congressman. I think he's grown, he, he, he I think he's a, grown up. Oh, yes, he was, but he was a dark horse in the beginning. Yes, he was. Everyone said, Ed, Ed Cox, who's he? I think Mario Cuomo was uh, was was the favorite uh, yes, at the indeed. beginning, and then of course you had Bella Abzug, who was so colorful, yes, and you yes. had Dick Ravage, mm -hmm. and you had other people like that. I miss Mrs. Abzug too. I think mm -hmm. we all miss. I think Bella Abzug should have stayed in the Congress. I think she was an excellent uh, Congresswoman. Mm -hmm. Well, Millicent Fenwick gets a lot more publicity now that Bella's not there. I see That's Millicent true. was on the front page of the New York. Uh, Times, Times yes. uh, today. Uh, well, well, that, now it's that, that's better than mm -hmm. having Rita Jen Rett on the, uh, on oh, the front page. I quoted your line yesterday, crediting <laughs> you, saying, there goes the neighbor. <laughs> Rita Jen. But uh, look, you, I think it was your column, too, that said that, uh, is it Golden, who's having his wife's taking over um, Gracie, Gracie, Mansion Gracie Mansion for a party? Yeah. Um, I'm not quibbling on this, but I'm just curious. Um, if somebody takes over Gracie Mansion for a party, do they pay? 
Oh, yeah, she would, uh, the Goldens would pay for they would the... Pay. Uh, I mean, I, they wouldn't pay for the use of the room, I'm sure, but the, the dinner itself and the wines or whatever, mm -hmm. I'm sure, would be paid by the Goldens, yes. Well, you know, I spent many unhappy months in Doctor's Hospital, which is across the street from Gracie Mansion, and I often wondered if the mayor ever went there himself. And you could always tell because he came with a, an escort of police cars, of course, with a police captain driving. Mm -hmm. But I think he spent very little time in the, in the, the mansion. Well, he did most of his entertaining there. Well, you remember, Ed, in the first uh, months of his, uh, of his office, uh, he actually spent many nights at his bachelor pad in Greenwich Village, That's which he has kept. Well, doesn't he still live there? And yes, well, he keeps it, but uh, I think he was he slept down there a lot of nights, and mm -hmm. then finally, I think the cops uh, said, "Look, you can't do this. It's not terribly uh -huh. secure." Mm -hmm. And uh, now, whether he has a little hotel room or someplace around town where he goes, I don't. I just don't know. Or maybe he might have a bedroom in City mm -hmm. Hall. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Barbara, could I have another glass of water? May I mm -hmm. have another glass? All right, of water. may I? My constant. Barbara, fear. alert. Alert. I am listening. <laughs> yes, she is. Oh, are you mm -hmm. sleeping? No, she's not sleeping. Barbara's busy, yes. Um, we're talking about the uh, mayor. There was, of course, such constant juxtaposition of the mayor's name with Bess Meyerson until uh, Bess lost the election. As she's not out of favor with the mayor. Oh no, she? I wouldn't think so. I, I you know, Bess Fine. is. Uh, yeah, take I think yeah. Bess is someone we're going to hear uh, more of. Mm -hmm. She's uh, she's just too bright. Uh, she has too much to offer, not to not to be mm -hmm. heard from. She was very ill there for a she while. She was in the hospital the same time I was. Uh, mm -hmm. I uh, I wrote something that she uh, took mm -hmm. uh, exception to. I said that friends were were quite worried about her because they couldn't seem to diagnose what the illness was, mm -hmm. and she was in the hospital. I think for about thirty days, starting around Christmas time, almost to the end of January, and. Uh, then I saw a picture of her yesterday, uh, which was taken in a New York restaurant called Fiorella's on, on 3rd Avenue. So she's mm -hmm. out and about again. She was out on mm -hmm. the town having having dinner. But I think she's still uh, a great pal of Ed Koch's. Uh, I don't know whether they see one another socially. I once wrote a parody for the New York Post of their, of their affair uh, called Tales of New York. Mm -hmm. And I suggested that um, she was such a take charge lady that she came over every morning and picked out his necktie. <laughs> well, you know, when, when she was um, elected to uh, be in the beauty contest, she was Miss New York, as I recall. I can't remember who the judges were, but Earl Wilson was one, and Edward and I were two others. Oh, you were? You mean the yes. year that she won uh, yes. Miss America? Yes. Oh, I didn't mm -hmm. know that. And, uh, oh, she was gorgeous. She still is a gorgeous looking woman. Oh yeah, she's yes. striking. So, and as you say, uh, to find the brains that uh, that match the beauty that she um, has is uh, it's a rare it's thing. unusual. Very, very rare. Now you mentioned Fiorella's. Um, who was the man uh, who was in um, Alien, um, Alien States? No, Altered States. Alters, yeah, Alters, William Alters Hurt. States. That was the same night mm -hmm. I'm talking about that we got the picture of Hurt. Yes. They are Bess Myerson was also there. Oh, was that? Uh, yeah. I'm gonna, just going to get a drink of water. Yes, like okay. Mm -hmm. um, all right. And let me take care of a couple of more of our commercial messages. Well, that's one nice, one nice thing about broadcasting at home. You can wander around into the kitchen and so forth and so on without creating much of a disturbance. Uh, personal touch home care we have on our list tonight. And uh, um, if anyone in your family needs home care following a an operation or a hospital stay or if you need someone to who's good at taking care of an elderly person or if you need a baby nurse or a nurse's aide or uh, someone who uh, can actually oversee a household and still keep an eye on an invalid all such help can be had through personal touch home care dr. Goldback and his wife Miriam she herself is a registered nurse uh, they're the dear people who run this highly personal service their uh, service is available 24 hours a day and uh, anyone that they send you, you know, you can depend on. The number to call, the 212 number to call, is 539-6800, 539-6800. In New Jersey, the 201 number is 343-7979, 343-7979. And Giordano's is a restaurant not far from WOR's headquarters. It's on 
409 West 39th Street. WOR is Broadway and, and 40th Street. And therefore, a lot of WORites do go to Giordano's, not only for luncheon, but they show up there for dinner, too. And a luncheon or a dinner there will be remembered by you and your guests with pleasure, I think. Um, they have so many dining rooms, little ones, big ones, nooks, crannies, and uh, you can dine under the stars in their courtyard, courtyard garden come nice weather. They have a superb wine cellar, continental entertainment night. They're convenient to the theaters and to Madison Square Garden. And they have the finest of northern Italian cuisine, and I think their prices are very moderate considering the excellence of the food. They're open seven days a week, lunch to late supper. They have valet parking, and their phone number is 947-3883, 947-3883. And uh, Jim Brady is our guest tonight. We have uh, one half hour more, and we'll, we our hours now during the month of March are 12 midnight till 2 a.m. and in April we switched to 10:30 uh, to midnight. And um, wh what were you, were you going to take off about? No, we were talking about. Uh, you mentioned uh, William uh, Hurt. Oh yes, and the uh, actor. Days. Now mm -hmm. he's uh, he's a remarkable fellow. Uh, I've sort of needled him in the paper today because he he was. Uh, he was acting very Marlon Brando, you know, not wanting mm -hmm. his picture taken, which I think is very silly. If you're a movie star, you may as well get your pic picture taken whenever you can. But uh, he is starring in Altered States, which is a movie that I didn't like very much. That's but he's a sound that just comes in. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, in which he ate the per poison mushroom and then mm -hmm. turned into a monkey. Uh, but he's in this new movie with Sigourney Weaver called uh, Eyewitness, and he's also starring off-Broadway in Child Byron all at the same time. He's a big, lanky fella, mm -hmm. about six foot four. He wears uh, steel-rimmed eyeglasses all the time. He certainly doesn't look like uh, your idea of a movie star, but he's a remarkable talent. Uh, the one time or two times that I've met him, he's a, a delightful fella. But Sigourney Weaver, who plays the girl in Eyewitness, the television reporter, is the daughter of Pat, uh, Pat Weaver. Yes, oh yes. And she's a we terrific We were talking actress. about Pat last night, yes. Uh, yeah. Is, is he uh, still out on the West Coast? He's out on the West Coast most of the time now. But mm -hmm. she's a terrific girl. She's mm -hmm. a big, tall girl. She's about six foot tall, I guess, with yeah, so very pretty mm -hmm. uh, dark hair. And uh, I went to a screening the other night and met her uh, there. And uh, I, it's fascinating to me, uh, and Edward knows so much more about show business than I do, how many uh, quotes movie stars unquotes there are in new york all the time now as opposed to hollywood like last night i went to elaine's after the liza minnelli party and there was gene hackman at one table and warren Beatty uh, at another table mm -hmm. here's uh, mr hurt running around town pacino al pacino i think lives here i think bobby de niro lives here i know that dustin hoffman lives here mm -hmm. uh, Red, and uh, robert redford lives robert here. redford has an apartment here now Milo paul, paul newman mm -hmm. lives up in connecticut and spends a lot of time in town mm -hmm. he probably has an apartment now a generation ago wouldn't all of these people have lived out in uh, in hollywood or malibu or someplace like that i think so yes mm -hmm. You know, Mila Sparman bought uh, Eric Sloan's place up in uh, in Connecticut, up near us. Who, right. who bought Mila Sparman? Mila uh, Sparman, the Foreman, director. The director. He's making uh, Ragtime. Ragtime. Oh, now yeah. he got Jimmy mm -hmm. Cagney to come out mm -hmm. of uh, retirement to mm -hmm. play a small role in yeah. that. Well, well Cagney's not well, you know. No, I know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Cagney lives up near us too. There. Yeah. He has two or three homes: one in Martha's Vineyard and one on the West Coast. But Could he, I say a he seems to like about Jimmy Cagney. You certainly may. He's one of the finest young men I ever knew. Mm -hmm. You do know him? Uh, yes. Intimately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's, um, uh, and there's a little restaurant in Kent, Connecticut, that has absolutely made a fortune because Jimmy Cagney loves the piano bar. Now, Jimmy doesn't drink much these days, but he loves the old songs, and Dolph Trayman, who used to be one of the music directors of WOR years and years ago owns this restaurant called the Fife and Drum. He's just put on a new uh, extension doubling the size of the restaurant. His wife has a gift shop on the grounds. It's right on Route 7. They've tripled the size of the gift shop. And I'm absolutely convinced 
That is because Jimmy Cagney goes there. So Well, Vladimir Horowitz shows in now and then, too. He so bought a condominium right across the road. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, but does uh, Jimmy Cagney sing to the, oh, to the piano he knows, player? He knows the verse as well as the chorus. Of, and, and, and he'll sing. And he, and he sings. Oh, well, that's now, terrific. Um, there, there is no newspaper in camp. Mm -hmm. The fact that oh, Jimmy wait Cagney... A minute. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, wait. I, I beg... There's yes. A weekly paper. Yes, the Camp Good, Good Times Good Dispatch. A weekly... One of the finest mm -hmm. papers. Uh, a, an old APA man runs it. Yes, but I mean it's not a big newspaper. But people come from far afield, and they well, come from. Well, it's not a big in size, but in circulation, it's enormous. But the point is that the the fact that Jimmy Cagney is at this restaurant so often, I think, has only been publicized on this program. But it brings people from all over oh, up, well, to, yeah. up to Gosh, Kent. I people have more terrific. loving memories of Jim Cag uh, Jimmy Cagney's movies than of almost any other. I have, a, I have a great pal called uh, uh, Bill Flanagan. Oh, William, I know William Bill. Flanagan, he's a, a financial writer. Uh, oh, no. Oh, no, no, no he no, was, was with the Wall Street Journal and Business mm -hmm. Week. He's a columnist uh, and editor at uh, Forbes magazine. And Bill Flanagan is a great, big, good-looking Irishman with, with a mustache. And he does a Jimmy Cagney imitation mm -hmm. at the drop of a hat. And he will do Yankee Doodle Dandy, and he will do uh, Mr. Roberts, and he will sing and play piano. and. Uh, so I've got to tell Flanagan about this place up in Kent, Connecticut, because he'll now move mm -hmm. up there. Well, he, he better find out. You see, uh, Cagney has, I say, two other homes. Mm -hmm. But the one in, in it's his, his home is not in Kent. It's about 15 miles from Kent, and it's over it's in, on it's the New York side. It's on the New York side, yes. yes, I know that. It's near the town of Millerton, but I, it's an, another name to the tiny little town where, where he lives. And um, he's, um, um, sort of, what else I want to tell you about Jimmy Cagney? Well, but he's not well. No, he's not well. No. He's had a couple shame. of strokes, but uh, it, it's, it's remarkable that he's as well as he is after two after two strokes. Uh, but um, oh, I can't think what it was. I was going to tell about him anyhow. We can. I see here that um, I, I was just about to say I, how sad it was that the uh, that the um, the club had uh, lost it. Oh, wait a minute. They found. I was talking about the little club. I understand it's closed. They lost their lease. Oh, did they? This I didn't know. This, this is, is not the no. This is Le Club, the uh, private yes. uh, establishment, uh -huh. which has now found a new uh, yeah, a well, new headquarters. I, I was so surprised that the Little Club closed, and and I'm told that it, that the rent had been you know tripled. Is this or the one on Second like Avenue? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now yeah. uh, I, uh, it must be very tough to run a place like that these days. I'm I'm continually amazed by the number by the optimism displayed by uh, entrepreneurs who will go into that business and and plunge in their money and their hopes and their dreams and and you know six months later they're out of business because and the reputation so is that on stake too because that liquor board probably the toughest institution sure. in New York mm -hmm. State. That's right. That's Jim, right. do you know a, a foreign restaurant named Snaffles? No, I do not. Well, uh, we're trying to find out where it is, Snaffles, because um, um, I, it's it's I it's in the British Isles someplace, maybe in Ireland. Anyhow, there's a restaurant over in the Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn that uh, um, wanted to take the name of Snaffles, and um, they <laughs> when their liquor license came back after all the travail, it was spelt Scaffles, S K A F F L E S. So rather than to go through trying to get that right. It, they changed everything, including the sign, and made it Scaffolds. Well, the first restaurant under the name of Scaffolds was, um, I guess, an Irish-type restaurant. It has now been taken over by a French chef who, with a partner, owns it. So uh, there's a French restaurant, and a very good one, in the Bay Ridge section called Scaffolds. Oh, Scaffolds. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a wonderful story, which I hope is true, about... Uh, the Palm Restaurant. And the, what? the Palm well, you know, Restaurant. The Palm. Just oh, one oh, more corporation. Yeah. That, that is, uh, of course, one of the great steakhouses. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, I've been going there for a long time. But the story is that it was started by these two uh, Italians who were, I believe, cousins many, mm -hmm. many years ago. And they went down to the uh, to the authority to get their license. And they were really just almost literally right off the boat. They knew how to run restaurants, but their English wasn't very good. so. They made application, and the man down at the application, the license bureau, said to them, what's the name, what do you want to call the restaurant? Well, they were from Parma, P-A-R-M-A, in Italy, and they said, Parma, Parma. 
So he wrote, he thought they were trying to say P A L M, mm. oh. and he put it down. So when they got their license mm -hmm. and they saw that it was it was under the name Palm, they decided, well, they're going to have to go with that too. Otherwise, they couldn't go through that red tape again. <laughs> so up went the sign, the Palm Restaurant, and of course it's now. Uh, I think it's all over the United States. Well, you know, when we first came to New York in 1935, it was one of the first restaurants that we started frequenting, and little Dominic was one of the partners, and he was so short, he had well, to stand he on a the patio. Dominic part, uh, the uh, dominant part. Yes, but well, he had... He, was he Bozzi or Ganzi? Um, well, I don't know. No, well, uh, Dominic was in the kitchen, anyhow, yeah. and he had to stand on a packing case to reach the top of the range. Huh? And <laughs> then... Uh, I've always loved the 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 uh, operating name of the of the concern. It's just one more corporation. Is its I, official I name just one more corporation? Well, of okay. course, for anyone who has never been there, all of the cartoonists down through the years yeah. have have left their work on the walls. Zito uh, Zito was the principal one. Yeah, mm -hmm. but uh, it was dating back to the early 1930s and maybe the 1920s. I don't well, know. But I know we knew it from 35. Little off and Annie mm -hmm. is up there and mm -hmm. uh, and. Chester Gump and uh, Terry and the Pirates and all of them. And then, of course, caricatures of various uh, yeah. people who have gone there through the years. I, I keep hoping that one day my, my caricature will appear on that wall. But uh, maybe, maybe if I pay my bill once in a while more, more that promptly. That could be arranged, I think. <laughs> have they still got the place across the street? They opened they the second They still have the place across the street. Mm -hmm. And they did an interesting mm -hmm. thing this past summer. They bought an old inn in East Hampton, where, mm -hmm. as you know, I have a, I yes, have a house, mm -hmm. uh, called the Hunting Inn. And uh, they've refurbished that, and it's uh, operating, and they put in a wonderful uh, dining room, uh, a palm-style, you know, steak operation. Do they have sawdust on the floor? And they have sawdust. I think they do. I think they have sawdust on the floor, and they have the same kind of waiters, and, uh, and it's uh, really a terrific place. But they could not keep help out there past Labor Day. Mm -hmm. uh, it just wouldn't have worked oh. for them. So they closed the... Uh, they close the operation down Labor Day, and they'll reopen it, I guess, in May. But that's a big advantage to those of us who live out on the east end oh. of Long Island because we don't have enough good restaurants. Well, of course, the, our own, we spent two summers in much of our time in East Hampton when Mr. Soule had the hedges. Oh, yes. And that was sheer heaven. I bet it was. All, I didn't know, know the Hamptons the then. His, uh, he had a few rooms, too, you know. You mm -hmm. could stay there, hotel style. And... Um, um, the Hedges uh, had been an inn for a long, long time, but no one ever ran a country in the way Soule ran it. That's I think that is now up for sale again. Uh, I may mm -hmm. be mistaken, but that's sad because it's a nice location. It's mm -hmm. a beautiful old building. I don't know what it's like inside. Uh, well, he had, he had fixed it up so beautifully. If it's anything like it was when, mm -hmm. when he had it, it's, it's marvelous. I uh, know. Oh, Soule, Soule was a great man. Of course, Soule has given rise to so many great French restaurants in New York, like Charles mm -hmm. Masson. Uh, oh, uh, the late mm -hmm. Charles Masson, who started uh, La Grenouille, mm -hmm. was was one of wasn't yes. he one of Soule's? Yes, uh, he was a waiter. Men? Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was captain. He was a captain, mm -hmm. and then of course uh, Paul, who runs uh, Chantilly, he comes out of that. Uh, yes. Uh, I don't know whether the Vaudor, I think, is a little bit different. I think the Vaudor has always been its own self. You know, up near Bloomingdale's, the uh, yes, I know. the bistro. I've always been very fond of that uh, no, no, place. Good house. Madrigal I've always liked. Well, we, we've always liked Madrigal. And in um, the um, uh, Pierre Bezin was a waiter at Soule's, who uh, later founded Le Patinier and Le Patinier de Soie and, yes. and all those, and is now the money behind the Cote Basque and the new purchase. Oh, that's good. I like yes, the uh -huh. Cote Basque now that it's uh, changed mm -hmm. hands. I think they're doing a, a good job. Well, Pierre lives in France, but uh, he's the... Uh, oh, I had some wonderful good. meals in France. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. You know the Brasserie Leap over on uh, the Boulevard Saint-Germain, uh, Saint which is uh, L-I-P-P. It's right across from the Du Magot, oh, you know, the, yes, famous, yes. the famous mm -hmm. uh, uh, bar and, and, and mm -hmm. outdoor cafe. Was that anyway, the, the White Horse? Uh, no, no, it's no. Not, not the White Horse, but the, the Brasserie Leap is an Alsatian restaurant. Mm. And uh, you go in there, I went in there last uh, Saturday and I had the choucroute, which mm -hmm. is that wonderful Alsatian meal. It's a great slab of ham and a slab of corned beef and some sauerkraut and a boiled potato and a big sausage mm -hmm. and hot mustard on it. And they, you drink beer there, Alsatian beer, which is very, very good, but you order the beer by the size of the glass. Now, I drink a Syrieux, uh, a serious glass, mm -hmm. but if you really are thirsty, you ask for a distingué, 
a distinguished class. Oh, and no. And that, of course, is, you know, <laughs> will hold a half gallon, I suppose. Well, now, in in England uh, or Ireland, you ask for a pint, don't you? That's right. Yeah, pint or half, but I love it. A, a distangue. Yeah, you know, distangue. If you're really yes. thirsty, you ask for a distangue. But distangue-y. you have to mm-hmm. walk up to the bar yourself and get it. Mm-hmm. Other car they do not have waiters. That's right. In in, uh, in just a bar room, yes. Well, getting back to Sergio Belensky, um, when in come summertime, uh, Serge was a great one, you know, for uh, I don't know what the name of this drink was, but you had an enormous glass, footed glass, a peeled peach in the bottom of the glass, which had been pricked oh, with a fork, yes, so yes, the peach yes. juices were running, and, and filled champagne. with champagne. That's right. Well, uh, after Serge. Uh, uh, was dead and gone. I made this a couple of times and it tasted good, but it didn't taste the way Serge made it. And I said something about it on the air, and one of the Russian colony, the white Russian colony, wrote me a letter and said, didn't you know Serge always put uh, uh, cognac in the bottom under the peach? Oh, that was the difference. That was the difference. I had never known there was anything but champagne in There's that. another great white Russian uh, story, uh, Peggy, that mm-hmm. uh, Uh, When they all came over here, when they were thrown out of their own country, or when, I guess, they left Europe when Hitler began to act up, a lot of them, and I won't mention the name of the cosmetic company because it would be unfair, but one of them got in a big job in sales at one of the American cosmetic companies. And so every attractive, uh, well-turned-out young white Russian gentleman who arrived penniless in New York but with a good suit, a good Savile Row suit and a polish on his shoes, was hired as a salesman for this cosmetic company. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were very dashing characters. And the way that they would make their money uh, for the company, and they all prospered, is that they would make love to uh, any number of uh, attractive ladies around New York. And uh, uh, they they were the real killers. They were the real playboys. But they made love to every girl in town. And they also, at the same time, would sell her $100 worth of, uh, of cosmetics. It was sort of uh-huh. like the Avon lady uh, <laughs> at, uh, under slightly <laughs> shadier circumstances. Oh, good. You know, there's a, a very nice-looking, well-tailored young man. He's been up here a couple of times, who is the pretender to the throne of Afghanistan. And he worked for International Fragrances for some time, you know, the... IFF, uh, yes. Yes. But um, he's, um, well, a a few weeks ago, I guess he's still there, uh, he is um, selling shirts at Bergdorf Goodman Mm. now. And... um, But if they had a monarchy again in Afghanistan, he would be the the king. He would be the 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 king. And on TV the other day, I saw... Uh, the um, man who would be the well, the pretender to the throne of, he tells is it Albania? I don't know. He's and a very he tall one. Very tall and very extremely well educated and so knowledgeable about military and naval yes, affairs. Yes, but I think he's the one who keeps, uh, he was arrested somewhere in France or Munich or something four or five years ago because he keeps an arsenal in his, in his hotel room or his apartment. And they found something like nine machine guns and, you know, and, and six bombs and, oh, and uh, a lot of six shooters and hand mm-hmm. grenades and everything else. He never travels anywhere without his, mm-hmm. without his private arsenal. Oh, and <laughs> Well, that, that sounds beaches to me, Jim, and I'll tell you why. There's a little thing called customs at every border, and there seems to be a border at every 20 Well, feet. but with airplanes... I think that this man, mm-hmm. because he was a, a member of royalty, you see, wouldn't have the bags opened. It was sort of like the diplomatic oh, pouch. Oh, I see. I see. And, but and in any event, something did slip up, and, and they caught him with all of this yes. uh, paraphernalia. And so someone said, well, why do you have all of these uh, armaments? And he mm-hmm. said, well, I'm always ready for a return to seize power in Albania. Oh, I see. Uh, so he was ready to go. Well, the, uh, the pretender, the king of Afghanistan, uh, goes armed. Now, I don't know whether he's armed at his job right now, but when he was here, um, I said to him, do you carry a, a, a gun? He said, certainly. He opened his jacket and he had two guns. Uh, he mm-hmm. had a, he mm-hmm. was armed. Mm-hmm. A mm-hmm. small man, very small. But beautifully tailored, beautiful beautifully manners, tailored. well uh, educated in England. And uh, the first time in my life I was ever close for a couple of hours to a man who I addressed as Your Majesty. Well, uh, I, I would uh, be interested in meeting him, and he's up at Bergdorf. Well, he was. He was working there you know. before Christmas now. Whether, but I'll tell you who knows where he is. Do you know Luther Green? No. Luther Green... Um, 
he's a well you should know him he just he has the contract now to, to do the um, l new landscaping for tavern on the green oh, oh. and uh, but at one time he was married to judith anderson twice and mm -hmm. he himself was a director and uh, quite a prominent one for many years mm -hmm. he has a a most interesting house the basement of a brownstone that is the most beautiful basement you have ever seen he has made it into a lush tropical place with all the asbestos pipes hidden under tropical foliage, real stuff that's growing there under the artificial lights. Yeah, but the trouble with basements, Peggy, is that you always get water bugs. Well, water bugs, well, he has a, a, a brook running through the middle of it, oh. and with little bridges across. Well, maybe he keeps a trout uh, in there that eats the <laughs> water bugs, I don't I know. I don't know, but he gives beautiful dinner parties there, <laughs> and he has one floor of the little dining area uh, that is all made of seashells in a mosaic. A oh. uh, architect digest or archi which is architectural a, digest did seven pages that's about a wonderful this magazine well you know you have I, I must see to it that you see loser green's place this basement is beyond belief beautiful well you know Jim and uh, but he is always one that always knows where he knows where the king is, is where the king is mm -hmm. the the uh, about the clamshell you know how hard they are yes they put them in vinegar or something, and then they flatten them out with a roll and use them as wallpaper and walls. Did you know this? I do not. I do not believe a word of this. Well, it oh, is it's quite true. true mm -hmm. And the entrance to the pier, the Fifth Avenue entrance, one time was completely yes done with the that flattened mm -hmm. clam shell. Mm -hmm. But it was a special kind of rubber. Mm -hmm. It was a special kind of clam uh, shell yes. that had a special iridescence, yes. and it was there until Bob Dowling bought the hotel. Yeah. And Bob Dowling <laughs> ripped our clamshells out. Oh. I know we always loved that. We lived there for seven years. How long? How Bob. long did you have to soak them in vinegar? I beg pardon. How long did you have to soak them in vinegar? That escaped me. I do not know. Mm. No, we. Yeah. But the, uh, it's been done in one place or another. Uh, oh, you pump. see uh, placemats now made out of shells flattened like that. Oh, really? Yes, up Saks Fifth Avenue have them and. And well, I've seen them at Bergdorf Learn something Goodman. new every day. I'm yes. delighted I so came on the show tonight. <laughs> now I know all about clamshells. Look how many things we've skipped around yeah. talking about today. Fantastic. I, I'm going to have get some. I'm going to collect some shells this summer out on the beach. Well, Luther Green's uh, shell floor, mosaic floor, oh, though, is yeah. not made of clamshells. It's made of the everything from the tiniest little periwinkle shells up to iridescent ones from the South Seas and and. Uh, uh, it it is just gorgeous. I don't know. Wasn't he married at one time to Judith Anderson? He was married to Judith Anderson two times. Twice. Yes, uh -huh. twice. Uh -huh. She's living out in California uh -huh. now. They have two children, and uh, the children come. But uh, Luther has, had just done some beautiful gardens in Wilton uh, for a very rich tycoon. And um, those gardens, I think, are featured in the current issue of Architectural Lot. Uh, and now he's, he's now he's landscaping the uh, tavern uh, on the green? He has a tavern on the green. I think that uh, the tavern on the green, and I've had my differences with Warner Leroy mm -hmm. uh, from uh, once or twice, professional differences, but I think he's done a marvelous job over mm -hmm. there. Uh, I, I think it's a pleasant place to go on a, uh, in the evening with the Well, it looks festive, and oh, you know you need terrific. places that look festive. I've been to some um, great parties over mm -hmm. there. and. Uh, the movie companies are very fond of taking over a room or indeed That's the whole right. place to give a party. And then the Good Morning America people uh, last year when they were celebrating their fifth anniversary, they took it over, I think, uh, uh, one evening. And there was a terrific party. Everyone from Barbara Walters and David mm -hmm. Hartman and all of them uh, showed up. And I'm always glad that, that they keep have kept all through the winter the little twinkling lights in oh, the Oh, they're trees. very pretty, yes. yes. And, and uh, when, the, when the park was still covered with snow mm -hmm. a month ago, uh, just going through there, because I had to go through there to get to and from uh, uh, ABC, which is, you know, over yes. the, mm -hmm. on Columbus Avenue at 67th Street. Uh, you know what I like also on the, on the west side? I've never been a west sider is uh, the Café des Artistes. Oh, right across oh, the street. Yes. When we worked it, you see, that we... That used to be, I don't know how it is today. I've been there for years, magnificent. We worked mm. at ABC TV for several years, and we used to do a show from 7 to 7.30 at night there, five nights a week. And was it over there in those days? Over too? there. Yeah. But you know, before they got the studio built the way it is now, that the location where the studio was had been a big stable for stabling horses. And on damp days, you were reminded of and that. You they were still when, uh, doing some of the construction. And one thing that was so sad, just before 
the evening programs would go on, the stagehands had to come out and shoot the rats. There were more rats left over from the stable, and the rats would squeal and cry, and oh, oh it was just but horrible. The, but they shoot the rats just before the show went on the air. Yes, because oh, they didn't want story. didn't want the rats running around over the. So, I some, oh, I, I mm -hmm. love that story. But you know, someone mm -hmm. someone over there. I don't know whether it was Roger Sharp or Doug Johnson on Channel Seven told me that. When something terrible happened on a Friday, something very important, it may have been Jack Kennedy's uh, shooting in, in Dallas, mm -hmm. but in any event, uh, Channel 7, or ABC itself, the network, had of course to send 10 or 12 people immediately across the country, whether it was to Dallas or wherever it was, there was this tremendous tragedy, and they suddenly realized that one minute after three o'clock in the afternoon that no one had enough money to get them there. Now, here's a great corporation. They didn't have the money. <laughs> so they went across the street to uh, the local Irish bar. And uh, he had 15 uh, himself, whoever the Irish bar, the pub keeper, where these guys drank all the time, went in the back room and emerged a few minutes later with $15,000 in cash, which he kept under the floorboard. And that was how ABC got to cover the assassination or whatever it was. They would not have oh. gotten there if the local gin mill operator didn't mm -hmm. have the money, which I think is a great story. Well, That's almost as good as shooting the rats before you went on the air. Well, the other story that I remember most from there, there was a makeup man named Harry. Oh. Yeah. And Harry was marvelous. He smoked, though, the most outrageously smelly cigars that I've ever known. I'm used to cigars. Any nonsense from stars or mm -hmm. directors or anybody else? But um, the rotation of uh, sequence when, when you got your makeup on there was this. I had to have my makeup put on just before I went on the air because it would sink into my skin so fast that if they put mm -hmm. it on an hour or a half hour beforehand it was no good. The two that were scheduled in that about that area was Ava Gabor, who just absolutely delighted all of them by going around mostly topless. <laughs> she did, on some occasions, have a flesh-colored lace bra that she would wear, but she never wanted to ruin the top or whatever she was. So in the makeup room, <laughs> she would she'd be topless. She'd be topless, except Harry would take his time about flinging that piece of cotton, striped cotton around uh, mm -hmm. her shoulders, you know, before he put the makeup on. The third one was a basset hound named Morgan, who used to be on the oh, air with yes. Kyle McDonald, who was the prettiest girl singer. And <laughs> ba the basset hound had to have a patch painted over one eye, around one eye. Uh -huh. They didn't consider his face to be photogenic enough unless this big black patch was there. <laughs> so. Ava, the Basset Hound, and myself were constantly hopping in and out of Harry's makeup chair, but with Ava's spectacular build and all, every stagehand who could be spared, every cameraman, had, had reason to come by the makeup room. It was the most hilarious place to work at that time. It was really wonderful. They all wanted to come in and pet the Basset Hound. Oh, sure. yes. Mor poor Mor Morgan, when, you know, uh, Morgan's people got divorced, and Morgan was a dog of divorce then. And the late uh, Dr. Schulberg, a veterinarian on 84th Street, took Morgan in and kept him the rest of his life. <laughs> and yeah. uh, he was a very popular star, Morgan T was. Talking about divorce uh, reminds me, of, of course, the death of Arnold Weisberger. Oh, yeah. uh, that was this, this sad This past me. weekend, uh, me. such a great man. Now, he represented... Uh, at one time, uh, I guess just about everyone. I think he represented mm -hmm. uh, um, Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton at the time of the divorce. I know that John Springer represented them both at the time of the divorce uh, as mm -hmm. a press agent, mm -hmm. and Springer came up with the great line, which may have also applied mm -hmm. to Weisberger, that uh, they weren't sure which one would get custody of, uh, of Springer. Of custody of Springer, yeah. oh, <laughs> that that is. Uh, that but is I'm sorry to see Arnold Weisberger go. Oh, Very I gentle, was too. Uh, decent mm -hmm. man. Very intelligent. Uh, great lawyer. Well, I, I we went. Mm -hmm. I went. Were you with me or not? I went down Chile on a safari. Oh, uh, yes, and he was along. No, I wasn't with you that time. Uh, uh, Arnold and his um, friend. I think Mary Mil Phillips was Milton, around. Uh, Milton Goldman. Goldman. Mary mm -hmm. Phillips, Milton Goldman, a lot of. Uh, Mary Phillips had worked with you at Harper's Bazaar, hadn't she? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. I haven't seen or heard of Mary for a long time. What's she doing? I guess she's still uh, over there. I don't know. Oh, mm -hmm. I liked her so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. Um, 
uh, Henry Sell, wasn't he on that yes, uh, yes. safari that you all went down to Chile on? Went to Chile. And didn't you run into Jim Farley down there quite by mistake? That's right. <laughs> what was that town I was oh, in? Um, oh, that I hotel know. in the... But did you know that uh, Betty Farley's husband died last week? No, I didn't yes. know that. Mm -hmm. I, knew, I knew Jim Farley because he had an office in Paris when I was over there as a foreign correspondent, and it was in the same building where my mm -hmm. office was, and I used to run into him in the elevator. Mm -hmm. And he had a remarkable memory. Oh. I, I introduced yes, myself yes, the yes. first time, mm -hmm. and he'd see me a, a year and a half or two years later, and he knew exactly who I was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he usually would know your middle initial if you yeah, used one. Yeah, and I mean, of course, yes. I was unimportant to him, but he, he uh -huh. knew exactly who I was. Uh -huh. Well, I miss Jim and Bess, and of course, Bess is uh, the most unlikely friendship I always thought was Bess Farley and uh, um, Beth Leary. You Beth, know Beth Leary. Did you yes, know Beth yes, Leary? Yes. Well, uh, of course, um, uh, and, you know, Beth had great connections with the royal family. and uh, uh, She sent more toys to Prince Charles when he was a baby and did more shopping in, for American toys for the royal family. And then well, she, she went over every summer. Well, she was great pal of the uh, Queen Mary. Yes, she was. And, uh, um, but all three of the children were for a special pet. Was it her. true that the Dowager Queen Mary had a, had a problem with, with kleptomania? I didn't ever hear it called that, but I heard that any time she admired anything at anybody's house or in any store, she expected them to give it to her. Oh. Well, no, I had understood that a lady-in-waiting was always dispatched to follow her around and settle accounts with the shopkeepers uh, if something had mm -hmm. found its way mysteriously into uh, the Queen Mother's uh, pocketbook. Well, yeah. I never heard that, but I heard that she did expect to be given anything she admired. Mm. And uh, I think that's uh, that true throughout the we do uh, European that? continent in the old days, perhaps no more, but... I don't know. That uh, Maybe the Duchess of Windsor had that same idea. <laughs> you know, it's almost time that we have to say goodnight to all his dear people. I hope that we've kept you awake, but now, pleasant dreams, and be with us again tomorrow night, will you? We're the Fitz G's, Good Edward night. and Peggy, and our dear guest today is Jim Brady. Good night. <laughs>